I'm not sure if the Cardinal is making his presence known. <laughs> but I wouldn't think this would be the music he'd choose. <laughs> Thank you all for making time to celebrate both the life of Archbishop Francis Cardinal George M a OMI and the publication of his book, A Godly Humanism, clarifying the hope that lies within two days after the first anniversary of his death. Uh, my name is Thomas Moore Donnelly. I serve as director of Lumen Christi's Institute Cultural Forum. Uh, by day, I serve as a Cook County judge. While I am pleased to be with you this evening, I hope we don't have an occasion to meet during the daylight hours. <laughs> Uh, the Lumen Christi Institute would like to thank its partners in this event, the Archdiocese of Chicago, Mundelein Seminary, the Chicago, the, excuse me, the Catholic Theological Union, Relevant Radio, and also acknowledge the support of co-chairs Richard and Christine Guzior, Patricia Kenny, Greg O'Leary, and Jim and Molly Perry. I would also like to thank the members of the host committee acknowledged in the program, and the staff of Lumen Christi, who did all the work to make this event possible. Finally, I'd like to introduce the moderator for today's event and a recent addition to the Board of Directors of the Lumen Christi Institute, Anna Bonta Moreland. She completed her doctorate in theology at Boston College under the direction of a Jesuit and University of Chicago alumnus, Father Michael J. Buckley, associate professor of Humanities at Villanova University. She is author of Known by Nature, Thomas Aquinas, On Natural Knowledge of God. An Argentinian, she has spoken several times for Lumen Christi Institute on her compatriot, Pope Francis. Please join me in welcoming Professor Anna Moreland. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Good. So it's an honor to be with you to celebrate Cardinal George's legacy two days after the anniversary of his death and to re reflect on his book, A Godly Humanism. As you know, the Cardinal finished his revisions of the manuscript of the book just nine days before his death, having dedicated over the last months of his life the one or two good hours he had each day to going through and revising the manuscript. This music is really annoying. <laughs> so, sorry, I'm like trying to be serious here. He worked through it not once but two times. It is a fitting sign of his dedication to teaching the Catholic tradition and to clarity of thought that this proved to be as he himself anticipated the last thing he would do before he would encounter, in his words, the final horizon that is God's infinite love. Another part of the Cardinal's intellectual legacy is, of course, the Lumen Christi Institute. When I was first asked to speak for the Institute, and later when I was asked to join the board, I readily accepted, since I am very dedicated to its vision. When he learned of the effort that his predecessor, Cardinal Joseph Bernardin, had developed, Cardinal George welcomed it and supported its incorporation just five months after being installed as Archbishop. He became, in a real sense, the Institute's founder. I first learned of the Lumen Christi Institute roughly 15 years ago when I was Director of Education at St. Mary's Campus Ministry at the University of Michigan, where my husband Michael was enrolled at law school. I was, I was a young pup then. Bishop Alan Vigneron, then Rector of Sacred Heart Seminary in Detroit, and now Archbishop of Detroit, arranged a lunch to discuss the vision of Lumen Christi with the Catholic chaplain at Michigan and me. <clears throat> Since then, I have witnessed the growth of the Lumen Christi Institute from a small mustard seed of a project to become an international model for a serious center of Catholic thought at a secular university. 
If we honor the Cardinal today for his service in the Archdiocese and for his intellectual leadership in both the American and international church, we should also recognize his leadership in fostering this project of a few Catholic scholars at, of all places, the University of Chicago. It is a great sign in our secular world that the Lumen Christi Institute has set forth the vision of the Catholic intellectual tradition at an American university globally recognized for its academic rigor and integrity. Part of the success of the Institute has come from the open friendship with which it has received from the contributions of Catholic scholars at Catholic institutions, especially those in this region, including the University of St. Mary of the Lake, Mundelein Seminary, Loyola University, DePaul University, Catholic Theological Union, Marquette University, and the University of Notre Dame, where I am visiting at its Center for Ethics and Culture this year. It has welcomed as participants in its life faculty and doctoral students from secular and Catholic universities across the world, including, as Tom Donnelly noted, my beloved teacher, Father Michael Buckley. Our program this evening provides a fitting celebration of a godly humanism, clarifying the hope that lies within. The book is the Cardinal's consideration of the Catholic intellectual tradition, whose pursuit involves the combination of, in his words, wisdom and discipleship. As the Cardinal states clearly, the Catholic disciple who seeks wisdom does so in the church, in communion with both the saints and doctors, the church celebrates and also with the Bishop of Rome and the bishops of the entire church. It is fitting, therefore, that this event takes place with the support of the Archdiocese and of its Archbishop, Blaise Supich. Since Archbishop Supich was already scheduled to visit St. Joseph's College Seminary this evening, he has taken time to prepare a recorded video greeting to open this evening's program. While the Archbishop needs no introduction in his own archdiocese, it's worth noting that in his doctoral dissertation at the Catholic University of America, he engaged and employed the thought of French philosopher Paul Ricoeur, who taught for many years at the University of Chicago Divinity School. Remarkably, Cardinal George, in his dissertation for a doctorate in philosophy at Tulane University, engaged the thought of pragmatist George Herbert Mead, one of the early chairs of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Chicago. Thanks to all of you for gathering to honor our beloved Francis Cardinal George in these days marking the first anniversary of his passing. While I'm unable to join you this evening, I will be with a number of you in a couple of days when we bless his gravestone at All Saints Cemetery. Special attention will be given this evening to the Cardinal's final book, A Godly Humanism, clarifying the hope that lies within. And I'm grateful to the Lumen Christi Institute for hosting this event. Aware that his death was near, the Cardinal remarked that finishing this book was a goal something he wanted to complete. Indeed, it is his final gift to us. And as he notes, to anyone who is striving to integrate wisdom and discipleship. The book's preface explains the idea that informed his vision. Simply put, it is that our Christian life is meant to be a communion, a communion in relationship with persons. First with God made known in Jesus Christ, then with our fellow Christians, with our neighbors, especially the poor, whom Cardinal George describes as the first citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And finally, with our enemies, yes, even with our adversaries, those who oppose or even wish us harm. The Cardinal mentions that even those with whom he often disagreed would be surprised to learn how he learned from them how to live as a disciple of the Lord. His gift to us, this very enlightening book, should prompt in us a reflective spirit about our lives, especially in terms of how open we are to communion with God and with others. Whether we try to draw others into communion or perhaps, more importantly, do we let others draw us into communion with them? A 
As Cardinal George points out, whom we pray for and the events included in our prayer tell us how broad and deep is the horizon of our life at any one moment. We give thanks to God for Cardinal George's life with us, for his service as a priest with the Oblates of Mary Macklet, a missionary order devoted to the poor, and for his ministry as a bishop, particularly his shepherding of this archdiocese, and for his intellectual leadership in the church. Let me suggest that as we consider the conflicts within our world, our nation, our cities, and even in our own church and families, we would do well to remember the vision of Christian life that Cardinal George left for us. It is a vision of relationships and communion. Thank you again for coming together to honor a great servant of the church. God bless you all. Our next speaker will be Gary Anderson, the Hesburgh Professor of Theology at the University of Notre Dame. Professor Anderson's research focuses on the reception of the Bible in early Judaism and Christianity, and he is author of the critically acclaimed Sin, a History, and most recently, Charity, the Place of the Poor in the Biblical Tradition. The Lumen Christi Institute has hosted him many times and is delighted that he and his wife, Lisa, have made time to be here on this occasion. After Professor Anderson, we will welcome Jean-Luc Marion, Professor Emeritus of the Sorbonne in Paris and Professor at the University of Chicago in its Divinity School, Committee on Social Thought and Department of Philosophy. He also holds a chair at the Institut Catholique of Paris and is a member of the Académie Française. Among many of his books are In the Self's Place, The Approach of St. Augustine, and God Without Being. He participated actively in the planning and establishment of the Lumen Christi Institute and interacted regularly with Cardinal George, including during the participation of Cardinal George and Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger in the celebration of the 60th anniversary of D-Day in Normandy in 2004. Since then, the Institute has kept Professor Marion in the harness, and he has contributed greatly to help the Institute fulfill the hope and love invested in it by Cardinal George. Please join me in welcoming Professor Anderson. Thank you very much for those kind words. I'm going to make use of this uh, PowerPoint for uh, a few biblical texts I would like to discuss this evening. <clears throat> it's an honor to be here today for this event for Cardinal George. The last time I saw him was an event at Lumen Christi at the University of Chicago, I think about five years or so ago. His interest in the intellectual life and its relationship to faith was profound and inspiring. Today I'd like to address an issue that he dwells upon at some length in his final book, and that would be the relationship of biblical exegesis to the teaching office of the church. As many of you perhaps are aware, the Contemporary Guild of Biblical Scholars understands its primary responsibility to be to the plain sense of the biblical text, even if this text, so it would seem, contradicts the official teaching of the church or synagogue. This particular dimension of biblical scholarship is quite complex, and we'd need a multi-day conference rather than a 20-minute lecture to get at the central issues and challenges that it raises. What I'd like to do this afternoon is propose, by way of one example, a way that the church's magisterial teaching can help us read the biblical text better, and I hope in doing so, that I will give fit tribute to the spirit of Cardinal George's final book. The issue that will concern us this afternoon is that of election. That is the act wherein God calls a person to be his servant. And I'll begin with this very famous slide of a picture by Caravaggio. 
So my focus this evening will be on a famous story of the call of Abraham in Genesis 12. I'd like to begin with this famous painting of Caravaggio that depicts the call of St. Matthew in the Gospels. The question asked by interpreters of the Bible since the days of Augustine, and subsequently we could enlist St. Thomas Aquinas, Martin Luther, John Calvin, and in the 20th century, perhaps most prominently, Karl Barth, is what prompts Matthew's yes to the call he receives from Jesus as depicted in this painting. Clearly the emphasis for the theological viewer of this painting cannot be on the religious genius of Saint Matthew himself. Rather, the principal actor in this scene must be the grace of God. The Catechism of the Catholic Church explains this as follows. <clears throat> the first work of the grace of the Holy Spirit is conversion, affecting justification in accordance with Jesus' proclamation at the beginning of the gospel. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Moved by grace, man turns toward God away from sin, thus accepting forgiveness and righteousness from on high. And then continuing a few paragraphs later, our justification, meaning our call from God and our response thereto, comes from the grace of God, grace's favor, the free and undeserved help that God gives us to respond to his call, to become children of God, adoptive sons, partakers of the divine nature and of eternal life. <clears throat> the element of divine grace is equally on display in what is perhaps the paradigmatic model of election, the call of Abraham in Genesis 12. Our text reads, Now the Lord said to Abram, as he was known before his name was changed, Go from your country, your kindred, your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who curses you I will curse. And by you all the families of the earth shall bless themselves. The key intertext to bear in mind as we read this story is the tale of the Tower of Babel that immediately precedes it. In that story, we learn that the whole earth, as the Bible recounts, had one language and the same words. And as the people migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, bitumen for mortar, and they said, come let us build for ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and then important and bold, let us make a name for ourselves, otherwise we will be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. <clears throat> in this story, the key element that I have highlighted here is that the builders wish to make their names great. In the call of Abraham, on the other hand, the establishment of a great name is also at issue. But now rather than being a human work, it is the subject of a divine benefaction. Indeed, as the Jewish biblical scholar John Levinson has observed, it'd be hard to find a better biblical text to illustrate the concept of salvation by grace alone than the call of Abraham. For prior to the promise that God makes in these verses, we learn nothing about the character of Abraham that would provide even the slimmest shred of evidence that he merits what God has just offered him. The call comes like a bolt out of the blue from nowhere. Yet this theology of salvation by grace alone is qualified dramatically at the close of Abraham's life. After this stupendous act of obedience, described in Genesis 22, that is, Abraham's near sacrifice of his beloved son Isaac, an angel intervenes at first simply to stop the test altogether. The text reads, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, 
here I am. The angel then went on to say, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Once the boy's life has been spared and a ram has been offered in his stead, the angel addresses Abraham a second time, and this time says, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time and said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you and will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. And by your descendants shall all the nations of the earth bless themselves, because you have obeyed my voice. Within the words of the promise found here in verses 17 and 18, we learn nothing new. Multiplying the descendants like the stars, as we see in verse 17, is something that's already been mentioned in Genesis 15. And the image of the sand on the seashore can be found in chapter 13. Possessing the gates of the enemies anticipates what will be said in Genesis 24. And the blessing of the nations of the earth in verse 18 takes us directly back to what we saw earlier in Genesis 12. In brief, we've heard all this before. What's new in this text is that all of these words of promise are now grounded not solely in God's gracious action, but rather in Abraham's act of obedience. No longer are these promises totally undeserved, writes the Jewish biblical scholar John Levinson, but quote, now they are in part the condign fruits of Abraham's act of obedience. Levinson goes on to say, quoting here, no longer is God's election of Abraham a matter of grace alone, which is to say a sheer act of arbitrariness, but now Abraham, by dint of this action, has vindicated God's faith in him, in the end, Abraham is proven worthy of the promises God graciously extended to him in the beginning. It is the, because you have done this, in verse 16, that God takes a solemn oath, the first oath in the entire Bible, to fulfill his outstanding promise to Abraham. If we remember that oath-taking and covenant-making overlap, and that oath itself can be a term for covenant, we see now that the binding of Isaac has become the basis for the Abrahamic covenant. Or to state the reverse, the Abrahamic covenant has now become the consequence of this stupendous act of obedience. Abraham's act of obedience stands to benefit the nation that derives from him for all time. End of quote. Now, if one was a Protestant reader of the Bible, this particular biblical text here in Genesis 22 would be something of a challenge. For no longer is the subject here simply divine grace, but that of human merit. And if one looks, for example, at the great commentary on the book of Genesis by the Protestant scholar Gerhard von Roth, these verses are passed over in silence. But you might reply, is this not, that is, these verses in Genesis 22, not a Catholic problem as well? After all, the selection that we read from the Catechism said, grace is favor. The free and undeserved help that God gives us to respond to his call to become children of God. But here we need to attend to another element found in the Catechism and Catholic teaching on the nature of grace. For the role of grace is not limited to the moment of justification, that is, the moment in which each of us is initially called by God. 
This dimension is what has been described in Genesis 12. And it is this dimension that's primarily in view in the Caravaggio painting on the call of St. Matthew. But grace is also that power that allows us to grow in Christ. It is that power that allows us to conform our lives to the pattern of Christ himself. A process that's called, at least in Eastern Christianity, that of theosis, deification, becoming like God. Well, with this in mind, let's look back at the Catechism. And first, let me give the full citation of paragraph 1989, which I have to say I cheated and didn't give you the full text earlier. The first work of grace being that of conversion, affecting justification, so on and so forth. But if we go to the end of this paragraph, it concludes with the remark, and this comes from the Council at Trent, Justification is not only the remission of sins, but also the sanctification, the making holy, the renewal of the interior man. The key sentence here, of course, is this last one. Sanctification refers to the process of the remaking of our fallen nature according to the image of God. Through the work of grace across the course of our lives, it is the hope that we will develop the ability to cooperate with that grace and eventually merit the salvation which was offered us at our moment of conversion. Continuing here with the Catechism, since the initiative belongs to God in the order of grace, no one can merit the initial grace of forgiveness and justification at the beginning of conversion. That's exactly what we saw in Genesis 12. Nothing Abraham had done merited the extraordinary promise that God put at his feet in those chapters. But moved by the Holy Spirit and by charity, we can then, that is subsequently, as we see in Genesis 22, merit for ourselves and for others the graces needed for our sanctification, for the increase of grace and charity, and indeed the attainment of eternal life. The quotation that introduces this entire teaching and this portion of the catechism about the nature of human merit comes from St. Augustine and tersely summarizes all that the Catholic Church wants to teach on this matter. Here, quoting Augustine, quote, you are glorified in the assembly of your holy ones for in crowning their merits, you are crowning your own gifts. What we see then, or what I'd like to suggest in chapters 12 and 22, the book of Genesis, is a very good scriptural illustration of what the catechism teaches about the relationship of divine grace to human works. Or perhaps to put the matter in its proper logical order, what we see in the catechism is an attempt to do justice to what the plain sense of the biblical text demands of us as readers. Here, returning to the theme with which I began, a theme deeply, of course, of interest to Cardinal George. The Bible and the magisterium are not in conflict. The magisterium here, in terms of the witness of the catechism, simply focuses our gaze on what God wants to reveal and has revealed in sacred scripture. If we return to the call of Caravaggio, we can see that this element of the call of, Car of uh, St. Matthew, I'm sorry, Caravaggio's painting, The Call of St. Matthew, uh, we can see that in this painting he's anticipated the remarks I've already made. The Call of St. Matthew, of course, appears to be the central subject of this painting. But as art historians have long noted, if we look at the way in which the hand is displayed that Jesus extends in the direction of Matthew is very similar to the direction of the hand God the Father extends to Adam in the Sistine Chapel when he fashions him. So what we see in Caravaggio's painting is not only the call of uh, Saint Matthew, but 
recalling the creation of Saint Adam, what we see of Adam, we see here the recreation of Matthew through the grace of Jesus Christ. Let me conclude with just a few remarks then. The first and most important point I hope I've made this evening, and very much in the spirit of the book that was the last book Cardinal George wrote, is that magisterial teaching, at least as evidenced in the Catechism, on the subject of sacred scripture, need not be seen as an obfuscating lens to reading the Bible. Indeed, quite the opposite. It can help us become better readers. Genesis 22, the text we looked at, especially what biblical scholars often call this second angelic address, in which the promise is made a second time to Abraham, has often been a stumbling block for biblical scholars. And if you want to see the evidence of that, if you have time tomorrow, simply go to any theological seminary to the commentaries on the book of Genesis and pick a few off the shelves and look at what scholars say about these verses. They are frequently passed over uh, in silence. But as a Catholic scholar, equipped with the insights of the catechism, I think we can see what our biblical writer wanted to say in these texts. I hope this evening I've done justice to the name and memory of Cardinal George. I know that a faithful reading of the Bible was deeply important to him, especially a, writing, a reading that was able to bring together what we might call a scholarly disposition toward the scriptures in accordance with a fidelity to the teaching office of the church with respect to those very two texts. For as Dei Verbum clearly teaches, the magisterium must always bow its head to the revealed word of God. And I think in this example, we can see that the magisterium nicely reflects what the word of God wishes to teach us about the relationship of grace to human action. Thank you. I'm very glad this evening to make some remarks on this last book by Cardinal Francis George. Clarifying the hope that lies within. Should I uh, rely on uh, American popular culture, I would say uh, it is like in Star Wars, there, there is still hope. <laughs> Why? The first line of the preface of that book is very clear. Let us read it. The essays in this volume are an exercise in integration. Integration. Uh, in fact, uh, there are in this book eight chapters, and three of them uh, use the word integration to integrate in their title. Integrated life, education that integrate culture and religion, integrating the Second Vatican Council. What is the meaning here of integration and why there is hope there. Integration means, in the mind of uh, Francis George, that first we are not committed to make a choice between what we as Christians, as Catholics, think and what the other, those who are not Catholics, don't think. I mean, it is not the more we stay on our positions, the more we are on the right track. Not because we are supposed to betray our own positions as Catholics, but because our position as Catholics are Catholics. 
That means they are universal. A, a Christian position on an issue which is not able to integrate the rest of the field of discussion does not really achieve what a Christian thought should be. That is the idea that <clears throat> the limits of, of my actual thinking should always be discussed and we should always ask ourselves whether the limitations could not be uh, overcome uh, and whether we could not, I don't say approve the other position, but make sense out of the question of the others into the Christian heritage. That is, Catholic thought cannot be partial. It should integrate. To, to explain, I think, this deep intuition in another way, we could think of the motto of the first speech ever, I think, given by Pope uh, Jean Paul II, when he said to the crowd, don't be afraid. And this don't be afraid can be uh, uh, understood not only for I would say, social, political issues, it can, it should indeed, but also for theoretical issues. That is, we, the Catholics, we should include in our position the reason, the reasons which lead other people to disagree with us. Again, this does not mean that we should agree with the disagreeing voices. But we have to understand and try to integrate the reason of the disagreement into a greater view. This greater view is precisely what the cardinal means by uh, culture. The Catholic thought, the Christian thought as such, should meet the old culture and discuss with all, with, with, with all culture. And it is in this way that we can integrate what has to be integrated and we can face the issues. I think this is the meaning of integration. There is no choice between faith and culture. There is only one way, it is to convert culture to faith. But to do that, we have to be facing the rest of the society and the rest of culture. We cannot be only ourselves against the rest of the culture. We have to integrate it. This, indeed, <coughs> means that, that's, that's the second point, I think, of this book, very important point, that we have to take very seriously, as the Cardinal did, the famous encyclic by Jean-Paul II, Fides et Ratio, Faith and Reason. The Cardinal says, the tenets of faith are not opposed to reason, page 14. Or, I believe precisely in order to understand. I believe precisely in order to understand. And quoting a columnist, an American columnist, who used to say, why the Pope has written an encyclica on <laughs> Fides, reason and faith? We all know that faith is about a feeling, subjective convictions on one side, and reason is reason. <laughs> so there is no relation between both. And com as com commented uh, Cardinal George on the, the title and the text of the encyclica, no, it is precisely that faith is a kind of reason. Faith is not an exception to reason. Faith is a form, and perhaps the most powerful form, of reason. Let us uh, 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 
take a very well-known example. You have all heard, I think, uh, at somewhere or, or somewhere else, uh, the fact that it is a Christian position to say, and a Catholic position, more precisely, to say, credo quia absurdum. I believe because it is absurd. And this is supposed to have been said by Tertullian. And this is really again and again an objection about the wager of faith, the irrationality of faith, and so on and so on. The point is that Tertullian never wrote that. <laughs> Tertullian, in the famous treatise on the, uh, the flesh of Christ, De Carne Christi, uh, Section uh, chapter 5, says something very different. He says that we, why do we believe in, for instance, in fact, he gives three examples, but let us concentrate on the last. Uh, why do we believe, why should we believe in the fact that Christ was buried, was resurrected, Why should we believe that? Why it is rational to believe what is written in the gospel? The answer, which is very uh, subtle and on line with the uh, rules of the today uh, philosophy of interpretation, hermeneutics. The argument of Tertullian is this. Would this be Uh, an invention uh, created by the faith or the tricky stupidity of the uh, author of the gospel, they would never indeed have included that in the narrative because it is unconceivable that a dead man could be alive again. So would you have an easy win and convince people, you should not impose to people to believe something which is unconceivable. unconceivable. So, the argument runs like that. If this is written, it is not because it is easy to make people to believe in that. It is easy to convince them of that. It is because it is obviously what they experience as absolutely true. So the gospel could not say something else because it is the core. So the very reason why we have to take this very seriously and perhaps believe and be convinced is a rational reason. It is, yes, it is impossible for us. If the gospel has said that, it is not because it is easy to convince us, it, because it is the fact the true fact, the bare fact, which is absolutely true and has to be said. So the fact that it is impossible, because the, the, the argument of Tertullian is the reason why we should believe that is that it is impossible. And this is not absurd. It is the reverse. That means, would this be simply an invention made by the, the evangelist, he would indeed not have chosen such a, an unbelievable event. So if he is quoting that unbelievable, impossible event, it is because he cannot do anything else. So on this example, uh, we see that even the allegedly most irrational uh, uh, irrational line of the creed is in fact, according to the laws of hermeneutics, perfectly rational. At a certain level, it is rational. The reason why we should pay attention to the resurrection of Christ is precisely because it is impossible. By impossible, we mean it is impossible to our human understanding and to the human normal course of life. 
We believe this because we believe that this is an achievement of God. And only God can do that. It's why if Christ is not resurrected, our faith is empty, as Paul says, which is perfectly rational. So, indeed, we believe something which is impossible for us. But as the Gospel says, and the book of Genesis 2, nothing is impossible to God. So, the, the fact that faith is dealing with the impossible is not irrational. What is irrational? It is to consider that what is impossible for us is impossible for God. When people say, well, the resurrection is impossible, we all know that, and the creation ex nihilo is impossible. It is rational to say that. This is obviously true for us, finite beings, finite minds. But in the case where God is uh, operating, it would be irrational that this may have remained impossible to God. So the concept of rationality should be expanded. And it's exactly the concern and the goal of the, encyclic the encyclica, faith and reason. That is, faith should be broad enough to make sense with faith. And faith should appear as a form of rationality and not an exception to rationality. This says, this I think was what the Cardinal, Cardinal Francis George intended when he was speaking about integration. The result of this is that the work of love, to speak like Kierkegaard, the work of the Christians, of the church, is to achieve this integration at any moment of history. Each generation has to do that job of integration. That is, to make faith rational in front of the non-believers, but also to support and reinforce our faith and make reason broad enough to uh, accept the, the strength of the possible. By strength of the possible, I mean, Cardinal George meant, I think, what is possible to God. And there is much more in the word, as seen from the point of view of God, than in our philosophy, to paraphrase Shakespeare. And integration is precisely to make room to the rationality of God, which is not the rationality of men. But there is no reason for the, for the Christian and in general, and the Catholic in particular, to admit that there are irrational limits imposed to faith. There is no reason to admit that what is said by God could not be rational in its way. This is, to some extent, a blasphemy. The idea that God is irrational, and to believe in God, is to admit irrationality. One of the names of God is Logos. And Logos can and should, it is at least one of the meanings, be translated by reason. So to say that faith cannot integrate rationality, that all the rationality cannot integrate into faith, is a blasphemy. And we should never accept that. So this is the second point. The first is integration. The second point in this book is filet et ratio. From this follows some consequences. And very quickly, let us uh, quote those consequences. The first is about theology. 
where theology ignores its subject, which is the, the church, it turns into philosophy of religion. It is a quote by Cardinal Ratzinger when he was not yet a pope, quoted by uh, Francis George, page 56. Being a teacher of time to time philosophy of religion, I should not rejoice with this, <laughs> with this quote, and nevertheless I do. <laughs> what is philosophy of religion? Uh, I ask my colleagues to just uh, 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 forget what I shall see, uh, say right now. <laughs> philosophy of religion is what religion uh, becomes when you don't believe what you say. <laughs> Would you believe it would be theology? <laughs> uh, so it is a bad compromise. Uh, the point is that theology is a way to integrate. And the theologian, uh, this is quoted by Francis George too, uh, he quoted the, the great uh, scholar uh, which was uh, 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 Pelican, professor in Yale, who said once that the problem with a theolo professor of theology is that they are supposed to, to do three things. To teach, to confess, to profess the faith, and to believe. And time to time, they teach more than they confess, and they confess more than they believe. And it's always the situation of anyone who teaches the word of God. Because we say much more than we really deeply believe in many cases. And it is a burden of this difficult, uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, job to do. When you teach mathematics, you have not that the problem to believe in what you say teach. But when you teach about God, about the word of God, you can say something and not be completely aware whether you, you trust that and believe that. So is the situation of the professor of theology hopeless? No. Because, and Cardinal George insists on that, you teach in the name of the church and for the faithful, because you start by teaching in the name of God. That is to say, you don't teach what you think. You teach what the old Christian experience amount to think. You teach in the name of the old church, not only in space, but in time. You know, to, to take an example, uh, uh, the problem of what uh, of the uh, uh, academic freedom. What are we, I don't speak about theology for the moment, what are we, uh, this is a, uh, an ethical question for any university professor, what are we allowed to teach to students? Are we allowed to express all our feelings, our desire, our fantasy, our hope, uh, or uh, anything, our ideology and so on? After all, we are free to speak, so we could teach anything, including the worst possible one, and some do. <laughs> so what is the limit? I ask myself very often that question. Am I not imposing to students something which I should not impose because it's against their freedom of thinking and things like that? Answer, at the university, you are supposed to say anything you can argue for. Anything which you can demonstrate is allowed to be said. If you cannot demonstrate it, stop it. That's the difference between what you say within the university and what you say when you make a political rally where you can say anything you want. <laughs> it is meaningless and without consequences. So you can lie because people are ready to, to listen to any possible lie. But that's not the question. At the university, you should stop when you cannot demonstrate. So in the case where you teach at the university or elsewhere, 
theology. How far can you go? When do you stop? And when you have to go, even if you are not completely uh, uh, convinced, you have not a strong belief. Answer, you have to go as far as the church went. The church that is in space, in space the two-day church, the universal church, and in history. And this is your limit. You are not teaching at the moment for yourself and for a public. You are teaching, that is a very famous sentence by Vincent de Lérins, what was, was believed by all, everywhere, at any time. That is your rule. And Francis George insists on the fact that the Christian has, the, the, the Christian has to teach in the name of the church, not his own theology, but the theology of the church, which means the theology, the global self-understanding of the believers everywhere and at any moment from the beginning. So it is a universalization of your own belief. So you teach more than you, you believe. And this is right, because we have always to have a deeper belief, a deeper faith than that we have. The second uh, point is just about, the, the next point is about the church. The church, say Francis George, is precisely the place of integration. The church has at any moment for any generation the duty to make possible the reunification of Christian uh, experience. That is, there is always an influence of the church on philosophy, on science, on art, on politics, that is, the church is always reaching out and trying to be in discussion or working together to build up something which is a more, a better world. But this is not an additional part of the role of the church. It is what the church has to do, to, do, to reach out. And it's why the Pope, uh, the present Pope, is right to say that the church is a battlefield hospital. So we are the, on, on the battlefield. Don't make the mistake that to hope that at the moment there will be no battle. We shall always be under fire in a battlefield. But in a battlefield, you can have an hospital. And the church is the hospital. And so uh, there is a cultural dimension of the witness, the Christian witness, which is really a part of it. That is, be there where no one expects you. Not to compromise, but to be precisely, invisibly different one of what is happening on the battlefield. And uh, Francis George has this very strong sentence I quote, it's page 75, the church is where you go when you want to be free. The church is where you go when you want to be free. And the experience of 20th century totalitarian states gave a strong confirmation of that. When you are in a situation of political oppression, the church is the place where you go when you want to be free even politically speaking. And the church is the place where you want to go if you want to be uh, 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 culturally free and not to be submitted to ideologies. And we could perhaps even say that, and it is something we say, said by, by Francis George, he says, after all, uh, Catholic hospitals are the only place safe where you are certain you will not be deliberately put to death. Unfortunately, this may be true. So the church is where you go when you want to be free. The idea that there is a, 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 
an opposition between freedom and being a Catholic is something we should never accept. Never say that in front of us. It is a lie. And the last point is about the universities. So there is a very deep reflection on the universities where, uh, and this has to be said, the example of the Lumen Christi Institute is quoted uh, at least three times, which is a lot in that short book. <coughs> and why uh, should, uh, uh, why uh, had uh, Cardinal Francis George made an analogy of uh, Lumen Christi <laughs> Institute? This will be my final point. <laughs> because of, uh, uh, he asked himself, well, there is a secularization of the universities, and in, this includes the Catholic universities as well. So how could it be possible to play the role of uh, a university professor, openly Catholic, and nevertheless uh, uh, rationally uh, acting within the uh, faculty, which is not uh, Catholic? Uh, the answer is there are three, three conditions to achieve that, according to Francis George. The first is you have to be a real academic scholar. So you, you have to be taken very seriously by the whole community. So you have to be a scholar, you have to be boring, you have to be hyper. You have to be hyper rational. You have to write a lot of boring footnotes. You have to do all the stuff. Right. The second point: you have to be genuinely a Catholic. Not to be a Catholic uh, by opinion, by origin, by inclination. But to be really a churchgoer, a believer, with the sacraments and all, all those things, without doubt for anyone. That means you have to be a, a, a sinner, but a sinner trying to convert. Because to be a Catholic is to admit that you are not a Catholic. That's the first, the first point. If you say, I am a Catholic, it is not a good start. <laughs> you are <laughs> a failed Catholic. And if you say, I, I try to be a Catholic, I am a failed Catholic, this is a better start. So you have to be that. But this is not enough. Because the two may uh, contradict, uh, not overlap. To be a real scholar, and to be a real Catholic, it, it could lead you to the, uh, this bad uh, situation of double truth. That is hypocrisy. So you have to be a faculty member Catholic, not alone, in a community, in a, in a rational discussion with others, and in a Christian community, in a small church, so to speak. After all, this is a good definition of Lumen Christi Institute, <laughs> and uh, uh, it is moving to see uh, how uh, uh, Cardinal George was uh, uh, paying attention to this uh, foundation. My conclusion is very simple. Uh, this book is a very strong and precise statement about the situation where we are. Uh, and it is indicating to us uh, what orientation could be misleading, which is that to keep our Christian and Catholic identity, we should, to some extent, uh, 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 establish us in uh, uh, conflict or rejection of the cultural work. The problem is not whether we have to dialogue, as they say, 
with the rest of the society. It is the way we have to do that. We have to do that not to uh, water up our Christian identity, but to integrate, that is, to reinterpret the crisis of the society from a Christian point of view. So it is a critical work. We have to be critical. But we have to be critical with the aim, final aim, to integrate. And after all, this is, I think, what uh, uh, Augustine, Saint Augustine, had in mind with his famous doctrine of the two cities. Uh, the cities of men loving themselves up to the point to contemplate God, and those who uh, can love God up to the point to contemplate themselves. In fact, only the Christian divine a celestial city is a real city, but in the middle of the common, uh, apparent, uh, terrestrial city. It is our situation, and uh, uh, Francis George, who was uh, deeply influenced by St. Augustine's theology, has told us that uh, last time in this very great book. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>